Recently, I played Valve's new game, Artifact, going six straight wins and moving up to the main stage in which I played Suns Fan, a titan of skill with an impeccable record. I took it home and that experience taught me a lot. I was champions of Artifact, uh, one of the first pro Artifact players out there in this grand world. Dan from Down Under makes the best play. Australian player in the world. That is the number one. This is the TI of Artifact, and he's already in. Incredible. Yeah. Knowing just how popular Artifact will become, I thought it right that I make a guide on not only how to play this insanely complex game and amazingly fun, I might add, but how to succeed. So let's begin. Before we go into specifics of how to play, I want to touch on what the objective of Artifact is, because you need this at the back of your mind so you can understand the rest. Artifact is a digital card game at its core, and the objective is to destroy two enemy towers. You do this by utilizing heroes, spells, and items which you get based on how you've built your deck. You need to outplay and outwit your opponent to win, and that's what makes Artifact so fun and so addictive. It truly rewards strategy. So how exactly do you play this game and play it better than your opponent? Mechanically, all you need to know is how to click and drag, as every action you need to take can be completed with just a mouse, just like other card games like Gwent and Hearthstone and Elder Scrolls Legends. With that out of the way, the first thing you need to do is to choose a deck. You will start with some pre-made decks and it's probably best to practice with those first, however when you're ready, you should build a deck of your own that complements the strategy you wish to employ and your playstyle. This is a crucial step to Artifact just like it is in many digital guard games. However, in Artifact it's not as straightforward. You have a deck of 40 cards in which you'll be drawing from. You also have two side decks, one deck of 5 hero cards and one deck of 9 item cards. So overall, you'll be choosing at least 54 cards before you play a match. Heroes and spells come in four colors. Red, the House of the Bold, which has heroes with high stats, combat manipulation, and crippling debuffs. Blue, the House of the Wise, which has powerful spells, strong late game, and card draw. Green, the House of the Dreamer, which has massive creeps, powerful buffs, and mana acceleration. And black, the House of the Cunning, which has assassination, power destruction and money generation. At the first stage of deck building, you'll need to decide which heroes you want to include in your deck as you need to build your deck around these cards. What do I mean? First and foremost, heroes will be the persistent cards on the field you need in order to cast your spells. For example, you need to have a red hero in play to play a red spell in that lane. If you had no hero, you are unable to play anything except items in that lane. If you have any other color hero, you'll be unable to play your red spells. The order in which you place your heroes in your deck will be important. The first three will always be deployed at the start of the game, be it randomly across the three lanes. The fourth will be deployed after round one and the fifth after round two, so knowing this will impact how you build. For example, you may want Luna to start on the field so she can start building up her Eclipse stacks. Second, a hero comes with three signature cards that will automatically be included in your deck. So Earthshaker, for example, is a blue hero. If I want to use him, I would automatically have three copies of his signature blue spell, Echo Slam, added to my deck of 40 cards. You can't have a hero without their signature cards, and you can't have signature cards included in your deck without the hero. This means that after choosing 5 heroes for your deck, your main deck will have 15 cards automatically inserted. A hero's balance comes from the combination of their stats, ability, and their signature cards. If we take a look at Earthshaker, we can see he has very low attack and health when compared to Bristleback. However, his signature card, Echo Slam, is very powerful and his ability Fissure is quite useful. Inversely, Bristleback has strong attack, a lot of health, and a great ability, but his signature spell, Viscous Nasal Goo, is not quite as game-changing as Echo Slam. You really need to decide how you want to play. Do you want to rush down the objectives early, or do you want to control your opponent? Maybe you want to be tricky. Whatever your strategy is, you need to now choose the remaining 25 cards for your 40 card deck. Be sure to consider how much mana they cost and aim for a good balance. It might be a good idea to include the spell Ventriloquy, for example, as getting to 7 mana so you can play Echo Slam might be hard. Therefore, a low cost blue spell that helps you control the board might be the way to go. You don't want nothing but high mana cost cards in this metaphorical deck, as you will struggle to do anything early. 
Keep in mind that if you want to play Echo Slam more reliably, it might be a good idea to include at least one other blue hero, as you don't need Earthshaker to play Echo Slam, you just need any blue hero. So pick those 25 other cards, finding a suitable mana curve and only including colors that you have a hero for. As a beginner, try to make a monocolored deck, but when you get more advanced, build a deck with two colors. Spells come in a variety of flavors. Be sure to right click a card to find out more about it. The best way to learn is to simply try it out. Finally, you have your item side deck. This deck contains nine items that will be randomly shown to you at the shopping stage of the match, which is right at the end of the round. Pick items that complement your heroes and your deck. If you have a very late game deck, perhaps some early, cheap and weak items may be what you get. If you have a deck that focuses around getting as much damage in early game, perhaps an item that lets you continue the onslaught and utilize the money that you'll be generating. Now you've picked your heroes, your spells and your items. For more advanced deck building techniques, be sure to check out my channel. So with your deck built, let's find a match. Your match will start with a preview of the heroes in your opponent's deck and he'll see a preview of yours. Take note. The first three heroes you place in your deck will be randomly deployed across three lanes. You won't always get Earthshaker in one lane, for example. Even if he was placed first in your deck, he may be deployed in the second or third lane. Three creeps will also be deployed randomly across the lanes, so it may be the case that your Earthshaker could be facing down another hero, a creep, or nothing at all. How everything deploys at the start can influence how you play the rest of the game. Creeps are weak units of 2 attack and 4 health and they'll run through stats and combat later. You start with 5 randomly drawn cards and so does your opponent. This will be drawn from your deck of 40 and not from your hero or item deck. The top has a lot of information for you to view at a glance. The first section shows you what heroes have yet to be deployed and when they will be available. A tick means that after this round is over, you'll be able to deploy that hero in any lane. Minus 1 means there's still 1 round remaining. From this we can see we have access to Zeus after this round ends and so will Suns fan. Next to the hero deployment infographic is the tower health infographic. It shows how much health you and your opponent's towers have indicated by the numbers. Usually both towers will be on 40 starting health. If the tech's initiative is on the top, it's your opponent's turn. If it's on the bottom, it's yours. It also shows who goes first on the next board with this technique. The top right is a timer that ticks down while it's your turn. It starts at 5 minutes and once it reaches 0, you lose. Stress not, it's only there to make sure people don't drag out each of their turns to the absolute maximum degree. After every round, 2 minutes is added to the timer so you should never run out if you play properly. Given that each of your turns is roughly 45 seconds to take an action, you need to make sure you don't overthink things. Which I'm sure is hard for a lot of you to do when you start out. Don't worry, when you have 15 seconds remaining the game will warn you and start ticking down. Next to the timer is your gold. You get 1 gold for every creep kill and 5 gold for every hero kill. This means you shouldn't throw away your hero's lives as it will give your opponent gold, however you should also not be too attached to your heroes as sometimes the right play is letting them die so they can be redeployed in another lane. After a hero dies, they take a break for one round end and then can be deployed after the following round. Example, say I lost Keith on my first round and he was in lane 3. I would not be able to deploy him after that round is over. I'll do the standard end of round stuff which I'll cover later, then play through the 3 boards again. At the end of that round, I'll be able to redeploy him on any lane. A viable strategy will be to let a hero die in a lane they are losing or kill them yourself in order to help secure another. I'll go through more advanced strategies in another video, see below for the link. Top right is your opponent's name and bottom right is yours. Above your name is an icon you can hover over to see your last played card and same for below the opponent's name. There is no graveyard yet and you can only see your last played card and your opponent's last played card. In the middle bottom to the right of your tower is your tower's health. When this is brought to zero, you lose the tower and your enemy only needs to destroy one more to win. The lane isn't forfeit though. as a 80 health ancient will spawn in the place of the tower that was destroyed. If that is destroyed, the opponent wins the game. Same thing applies to you. Once again, destroying two towers or the ancient will win you the game. To the left of the tower health is your mana. Top is how much you have remained to use in this lane and the bottom is how much total the tower has started with. You start the game with 3 mana. 
and you use mana to cast spells in your deck. So if you have a card in hand that costs 3 or less mana, you can play it on your turn and this is why having cards in your deck that aren't all expensive is important. Example, I cast Tower Barrage here in order to get a favorable trade against a deck that excels early game even though my deck is built for the late game. We can see here, Tower Barrage only costs 3 mana so I'm able to use it early to make sure my opponent doesn't get out of control. Under the mana cost is the type of card it is. You can right click the card for more information like I mentioned before so be sure to do that. So each lane gets 1 mana passively every round. On round 2 you'll have 4 mana to spend, round 3, 5 mana and so on. Let's say you go first which is called having the initiative. You can take an action or press the coin to pass. If you take an action which includes playing a card, a hero's ability or casting an item, it will take effect then it will be your opponent's turn. He can either play an action or pass. If he plays an action it will move back to your turn. Now let's say you passed instead. It would move on to your opponent. If he plays a card it will move back to you. But if he passes the game will move on to the next lane. Once all three lanes have been passed, it's the end of the round. So to reiterate, both players need to pass in order to move on to the next lane. Important to note is initiative. Whoever passed first will play first on the next lane. This includes moving from board 3 to board 1. It's a viable strategy to do nothing on one board in order to play first on the next. However, if you pass, your opponent plays a card and then you choose to play another in response, you'll not go first in the next lane. It's whoever passes first when both players have opted to pass. Seems complicated but it's easy to understand when you play. The game will start with either you or your opponent going first, indicated by the colored coin on your right or top left and the initiative text at the top. The coin is also the button you press to pass your turn, but you can also use the spacebar. Once both players are passed, the clash happens. To explain what happens in the clash, I have to explain the numbers you're seeing at the bottom of the card. Let me show you this scene to illustrate. Looking at Keith, the first number on the left is his attack value. This is how much damage he'll do to whoever he is attacking. Who he's attacking is shown by the arrow above his card or below if you're looking at the enemy. In this case, he's attacking Sola Khan, who's his direct neighbor. The number next to that is his armor. This is how much damage he blocks. Say an enemy was to hit him for 2 damage, since he has 1 armor, he would only receive 1 damage to his health. His health starts at 11, and once that hits 0, he'll be condemned, which will make him respawn after 2 rounds, which we've mentioned before. So when looking at this scene, we see that Sola Khan is about to hit Keef for 7 damage. This is because her attack of 8 is reduced by 1 from Keef's armor. We also see Keef is about to hit Sola Khan for 6, which is enough to kill her. We know she'll die in the coming clash because of the red X over her card. Artifact will try to illustrate all of this and show you what's about to happen before it does. Keef does not have an ability, but Sola Khan does. Her ability is passive and it makes it so that when she hits a tower, she'll do 4 extra damage. Some abilities are active though, like Earthshaker's Fissure and will take some rounds to charge and recharge. In Earthshaker's case, it takes 4 rounds to be available to use, but when it's ready, it can be cast like an action to stun his enemy neighbors, making them unable to attack in the following clash. Now above the portraits on the hero cards is 3 squares. These are item slots. Each hero can equip 1 weapon, 1 piece of armor and 1 accessory at any given time, denoted by the icons. If you equip an item to the hero and they already have an item of that type, the existing item will be destroyed. Items give hero modifications to their stats or provide abilities that can help in the clash. Items stay on the hero permanently even through death, unless the items are condemned by an effect. Just to reiterate, condemned is basically the keyword they use for death. Heroes stats can be modified or boosted by cards and effects. If something uses the keyword modify, this is a permanent effect, staying with the hero throughout death. If the boost doesn't use the keyword modify, it will be temporary. Now that you understand stats, you understand what happens after both players pass a lane. Units will attack their targets, dealing damage, taking damage and dying according to the numbers. 
In this case, Keith kills Sula Khan, which gives me five gold. This was the perfect situation because not only did we stop Sula from hitting the tower for bonus damage, we killed her getting gold. It's not just heroes who fight. Creeps and summon units do as well in exactly the same way. They have stats and even abilities, but only heroes can equip items. So the round ends after the third lane clashes. What now? It's shopping time. The gold you earn from killing creeps, heroes, and applying particular card effects like payday can be spent to purchase items. The shop will open and within is three items. Left is the secret shop item. These items are randomly generated each round and will change each round. If you buy it, there'll not be another item underneath it. So it's a one-off thing each round. If you choose not to buy it or can't afford it, you can spend gold to hold the item for next round. In the middle is a random item from your side deck of nine cards. If you buy an item from there, it'll bring up the next randomly until you buy out all nine and then there'll be none more. On the right is the consumables and these are items that generally have a one-time effect like a town portal scroll which will take a hero out of the lane for you for redeployment after the round ends. I didn't mention it before but when a hero is taken off the field, it will return with all damage healed, all of its modifiers on and all of the items that it had. Now below the item's name is an infographic which shows where it goes on the hero. This plate being the armor slot and the cloak being the accessory slot. The bottle icon indicates the item is a consumable. In the Traveler's Cloak's case, it will be attached to the accessory slot on the hero and provide four extra health. Items are played like any other card, which means it uses a turn to play. This can be good and bad. Good because if you're waiting for your opponent to play a particular card or run out of mana before you do your big play, using an item first can stall his turns out. It can also be bad because it means you can't apply your item and play a spell you wish to get off quickly within the same action. You'll need to make a choice. Once you buy your items, they'll go into your hand. Please note, you'll not be able to see your opponent's cards, only how much he has in his hand. Until you both finish buying, you'll not see how much gold he has spent or how many cards he has gained. After shopping has ended though, you can. Good players will count how much their opponent spent and how many cards they gained, which will give you a rough idea of what was bought and what to expect. Next will be the deployment phase, which was done automatically at the start of the game, but will be mostly under your control at the end of every round moving forward. Any heroes that are ready to deploy will hover on the screen for you to drag into any lane you wish. Keep in mind that this is a hugely important step. Sometimes you may be losing a lane and it might be best to deploy in another or maybe deploying in one will put your hero in danger. You need to consider these things. While deploying your hero, you'll choose a lane, not the position in that lane. The rules work like this. A unit must be placed opposite an enemy if able. If there's no room in front of enemies, it will be placed randomly either left or right. With this in mind, you won't be 100% sure where your hero will deploy in the lane most of the time. In this case, if I was to deploy Zeus in the left lane, he could be either to the left of my creep or to the right of Bristleback. Also, every deployment phase, you'll get two creeps deployed randomly to a random lane. In this case, the two are being spawned in the third lane. They might spawn in the first and the second, or the second and the third, or the first and the third, or two in one lane, you can't be sure. You also can't be sure where the enemy hero is being deployed or where their creeps are going, so you have to make some predictions. After both parties have chose where to deploy their hero, if any, and hit the coin, the cute imps will scuttle out and place the cards. In this case, Zeus was randomly placed to the left of the board, right opposite a creep. If units spawn directly opposite each other, they'll always be facing off. However, if something spawns in with nothing opposite it, you'll get a random direction assigned. In this case, Bristle had the right arrow. Nothing is in that direction, so he's automatically facing down the tower. If the arrow had been to the left though, he would be attacking the enemy creep to the left of him instead of the tower. This dynamic is something you need to seriously consider. You may only have a little bit of health left on the enemy tower and your units could be directed to attack something to their left or right instead of attacking straight ahead and hitting that tower and finishing it off. The chances of getting a straight arrow is 50%. Left is 25% and right is 25%. So all up, it's 50% chance to attack to the side. You can change the direction of attack with cards though. 
New Orders, for example, does this and can be quite powerful if used at the right time. If this is confusing, just keep in mind that just because you deploy a hero in a lane doesn't mean it'll go where you want or attack who you want. The randomness is there to prevent you and your opponent from abusing some effects and heroes and sweeping once you get a slight advantage in power. Also, it adds to the spectator value. Just expect to lose a game here and there just because you lost a bit of a dice roll. Now after deployment begins the next round on board number one with the person who has the initiative. You now have one more mana than last round and draw two more cards. You don't have a maximum hand size so you can hold as much as you want. You also don't have limited board space so you can have as many units as you wish. In fact, not much is capped including how much attack, armor and health units can have. I actually won on stage using an effect that made my hero's attack, armor and health go to ridiculous levels. So now all you have left is to play out your turns, your rounds and take down the enemy before he takes you down. How you do this will be based on your playstyle and the deck you've selected. It's about practice, get in there, play some games, lose and learn from it. This is a difficult game with a lot of moving parts but once you understand the mechanics and what to expect, it will become second nature. Then all that's left is understanding what cards your opponent can have and playing around them, but that's to be the best. For those just starting, this guide has set you up to jump into Artifact and play without too much trouble. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to chat to you on my Discord, link below. There's a room for just Artifact fans and if I can't help you, they will. It's always good to chat to like-minded individuals. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and comment, it helps a lot. For all else Artifact, be sure to sub to this channel as I'll be posting a ton more. I'm Dan and I'll see you again soon. Oh, I'm doing so good, how are you? Hold that microphone oh, right here, dog. Still shaking. Uh, <laughs> our newest champions of Artifact, uh, one of the first pro Artifact players out there in this grand world. Dan from Down Under makes the his best way. Australian player in the world. That is the number one. This is the TI of Artifact and he's already in. Uh, incredible. Yeah. Incredible.